I'm uh, Dr. Emran Harris, um, and uh, I've worked in uh, research integrity, research ethics, open science, uh, responsible research kind of area uh, for a number of years. And um, I used to give um, training workshops on, on open science, including uh, uh, data uh, for, for uh, several years of my last project. Um, so that's kind of how I'm here today. Uh, so I just want to quickly go through a few things. And I think I'm touching on a few things that um, my fellow speakers are going to talk about as well, um, such as training and software. So I'll, I'll, I'll move on from those quite quickly because obviously I don't want to take up space uh, when you've got people who have more expertise. Um, but I'm very quickly just going to start with a, a fair data analogy that I use in training. Uh, this helps, I think, just get us moving from the, the abstract terms uh, to something a little bit more concrete. And also, if you are thinking of doing any trading yourselves, it's, it's a nice, um, nice thing to use. Uh, then I'm going to talk about impediments and solutions. Um, so I didn't want to just kind of reiterate a lot of the information that's already out there, but maybe move the conversation a little bit forward in terms of kind of where we are now. Um, and instead, I mean, you could call it impediments and solutions or challenges and successes. And uh, then looking maybe at a little bit of fair guidelines of um, what we could kind of uh, do more of, um, what some some ways we could could manage fair data uh, could be. So just straight on with the, um, I don't know if you can see the last image, I'll just move this down. Uh, so the um, fair uh, data analogy. Um, so there's a YouTube link in the bottom right corner. You can watch me give the, the whole thing in detail. Um, or, and you're welcome, of course, if you do find it useful to embed it in any kind of online courses, uh, it's completely CC BY. Um, um, but the way it works is I, um, when explaining it, I talk about data as treasure. So if you imagine you heard about some hidden treasure, you know, like, you know, a, a pirate thing or something. And um, first of all, you you need to be able to find the treasure. So you would need a map, you know, you need to be able to find it. And then if you knew where it was, you need to be able to get to it. So are there shark infested waters? Are there bandits? Are there whatever? And then if you found the treasure chest, could you actually would you have the right key? It's no good if you've got, say, a Yale modern key and it's an old key or vice versa. So could you actually get get into the, the treasure chest? And then when if you got into the treasure chest, would the treasure be something? Would it be crisp euro notes or dollar notes? Or would it be some weird old money with skulls on it, um, which is, is not very useful to anyone? Um, so, yeah, I just use this analogy just to get uh, us thinking maybe in a, a slightly more um dynamic way about what fair actually means what the individual parts of the fair uh, acronym actually stand for and i find this can be quite useful um to make it a bit more um yeah a bit more real so yeah that's just to kind of warm us up and now um some of the, the a little bit more uh policy side of things a little bit more um in depth uh, so impediments, or I, I guess you could also look at them as challenges. Um, uh, so the first one that I, I think needs mentioning is the inadequate storage um, and inadequate repositories for uh, large sensitive um, or discipline specific data. So for instance, I know that the earth sciences um, often complain that they don't feel they have a repository that fully uh, meets their data requirements. Um, so, uh, because obviously that, that's got some quite specialist uh, requirements and uh, you want to be storing data in a very, um, in a very specific way and so generic repositories aren't, aren't really working. And um, so that's, you know, immediately you, you, you've, you've got to think about not just, when you're thinking about fair data, you're not just thinking about the fair principles, you're also the data part of that fair data um, and in order to make data fair uh, there needs to be um, sufficient technical um, support uh, for the variety of data that research data that's being produced um, you've also got things like very large data sets when I was doing training I'd often hear this from researchers saying okay but you know I'm looking at terabytes upon terabytes of data and they simply there aren't repositories that can handle that 
Um, and then sensitive data. So, you know, as I said, I worked on data uh, governance, data ethics. And, you know, you obviously, I'm sure you're all aware, can't just be putting personal or medical data in, uh, at, you know, Zenodo. Um, so balancing fair and ethical treatment of data is, you know, I could give an hour long presentation just on that. But obviously, I just want to flag it up as something to think about um, when we're talking about fair data. Um, so moving, moving on, uh, discipline differences in output in, uh, and terms impacting interoperability. So interdisciplinary interoperability, try saying that when you're drunk, um, is, is, uh, is a big issue. So particularly uh, with the social sciences and the humanities, you've got um, just different terms, different terminologies. Uh, you've got different attitudes to uh, persistent identifiers. So ORCID, I had my ORC ID um, up at the, the start, but that's um, not necessarily something that all disciplines are asking their researchers to do. Um, so that you have these, these gaps, if you like, in terms of findability. Um, and uh, yeah, different uh, levels of, of outputs and, and uh, you know, how things, how variables are coded um, can really impact interoperability. And I think it's also important to note that, you know, interoperability is often somewhat forgotten. Um, it's probably the hardest of the FAIR data principles to get right. Uh, findable is often the most, um, the easiest, and it's the one people start with. Um, but, you know, interoperability is, is the most difficult to, to, to define and it's the most difficult to put into practice. Um, so I think that's very much worth, worth flagging. Um, so those are kind of some technical challenges. Um, then you've also got um, some more, maybe you would call them social um, challenges. So as I'm sure um, the, uh, the wonderful organizers of, of Open Life Science will attest, there are plenty of solutions um, at a community level, um, but the the sustainability of those solutions is is often uh, difficult because the, the you know the funding isn't there. People are doing these things as side projects, um, and uh, that is impacting the ability of fair data to be, just become data. Um, that's the goal, right? At the end, we want fair data to just be data. Um, and then the, the, the final thing is a lack of legal or licensing knowledge. And this obviously relates to the R of FAIR, reusable. Um, and uh, the link, if you, the hyperlink I've got in the slides leads to um, research by a colleague and friend of mine. Um, that's not why I linked it, she's just very good. <laughs> um, but uh, she's done work on, on research on um, how the concerns about say GDPR and other, um, uh, legal aspects of data reuse and sharing um, often hold researchers back from making their data fair, from making it findable and accessible, um, because they, they, they're not sure how to navigate and there isn't enough first level support within universities about the legal issues. Um, and then you've got your classic fear of scooping, uh, which I think we're all kind of familiar with. Um, so yeah, uh, solutions or successes. So it has become more easy, uh, become easier and more normal to cite data and to create uh, uh, data as, as a publication. Um, it's definitely anecdotally, and also there is some evidence for this. I haven't uh, actually put a reference here because it's the, the report I read is still under embargo. Um, but uh, yeah, um, it's the, the, the most recent surveys are definitely showing that it is becoming normalized. Um, so support uh, from uh, repositories. Um, so you've got the core trust seal. I'm, I'm, I, I'm not sure how many are familiar with that, but essentially it's something that repositories can acquire to show that they are a reliable repository where you can put your data. But the core trust seal requirements map quite closely onto the fair data principles. Um, so in, 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 in getting the core trust seal, they are actually meeting fair requirements, which um, is obviously a, a, a big success and a big step forward. Then you've got things like virtual research environments. I've given an example run by the Quest Center, which is, is here in Berlin. Um, and uh, this is where um, research is, it's kind of what it, it sounds like. Um, probably some of you are far more familiar with it than I, 
but um, it's you know essentially a place, a virtual space where researchers can create work on research together. This obviously is 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 massively helpful towards fair uh, data because it's um, all the data is being worked on together, sometimes interdisciplinarily. And um, the trouble with that, though, there is a, a kind of downside, a danger of that, is that you end up with these VREs as silos. So um, that no one else who wasn't originally in the virtual research environment can then reuse that data. So that's the, the slight danger of that. Also, the expectations and support by funders and institutions are changing. Um, and you know, data management plans, uh, which often involve some aspect of the FAIR principles, though not enough, are becoming very um, uh, normal and expected. Um, and institutions are moving somewhat towards having you know, data training and open data ideas. So what could be fairer? What could be more fair? I, I've mentioned software here, but I'm not going to, to uh, say anything more on that because I know uh, one of my fellow speakers is, is going to talk at more detail. Uh, but just that, you know, while um, open source kind of led the way uh, in terms of openness generally, uh, there are inconsistencies in terms of, of software being fair. Uh, services, so this is this twofold. Um, first of all, you have um, could services incorporate FAIR more? So if you imagine, say, a library giving data training, could those uh, services talk more about fairness uh, and, and helping researchers understand the FAIR principles, but also the, the, the service themselves, are they FAIR? So is the training recorded? Is it findable? Is it accessible? You know, can it be? Uh, you know, can it be downloaded? Um, and you know, my and in terms of accessibility, we often mean uh, sort of technical accessibility, but also we should think about accessibility in terms of um, of, of uh, disability. Um, and I noticed, you know, you're using the otter.ai transcript um, so that this this um, where, you know this meeting today is is more accessible. And I ran a, a podcast for several years on open science. And you know, in uh, to you know, out of ignorance and um, just, I guess, just not, not yeah, ignorance. Uh, we didn't often provide a transcript for that, which meant that people who had hearing disabilities couldn't access that information, which is, you know, um, is not is not the right, it's not best practice, and it did limit the accessibility of that information. So uh, there's a project. Um, if you click on the link that is looking at fair assessment and, and how services and service providers can make that self assessment on whether things are fair. Uh, and then finally, just uh, workflows, they could be more fair. Some things towards that, as you know, obviously, my, my experiment, uh, where you can kind of it's a bit like a open notebook type thing. And then persistent identifiers um, obviously are, are helpful with seeing where people are um, and sharing that workflow. Very quickly, because uh, I know I'm, I'm, I'm running low on time, um, the other side of this making things fairer, uh, compliance. So this is a, a checklist, um, you know, as to whether things um, have been fair. And this is really useful in just in terms of, you know, using it. Um, with your own projects, looking at whether you've you've made things fair. So if you're doing any training, it's 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 very useful. Uh, but obviously, you know, you, it could be used in a very soft way, like a, as a checklist, or it could be used by funders. You can imagine in a very kind of strict way, like have you done each of these things? If not, you're not going to get your money, sort of way. Um, and then metrics, I put and metrics question mark, and there's a, a report there. Um, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, I do recommend you you take a look at that. Uh, obviously, I think we're all very wary of metrics, given where that's landed us in the publishing industry. Um, but fair metrics might be a way forward. And it's something that I think funders and people like the European Commission are, are going to be very keen on, very policy-minded people are going to like that. Um, so it's something maybe to, to have an idea about um, in general. Uh, so I've got some further reading links. They're also in the, the original uh, document. And uh, yeah, there's, there's links to contact me. Um, so I'll stop talking now. I'm not sure I am for time. I'll take any questions if there's time for that. If not, happy to, uh, you know, do that via writing. <laughs>